thank those of you who came out yesterday to show your support for Nadine and the Bowser family, and also especially for those of you that helped prepare the wonderful food and organized the fellowship afterwards and played a part in the service. So thank you very much on behalf of the Bowser family. Today we're going to continue our series in the book of James. Today we, we look in James chapter 1, and we are going to look in verses 13 through 16 today. And our topic today is the fun topic of how to resist temptation. Uh, and I'm sure no one here ever faces temptation. Um, so this is just hypothetical message, of course. But we are going to look at, at how we can resist temptation in our, in our walks with the Lord. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you give me the words to share this morning. I pray that I will only share what, I, what you would want me to share this morning. May this message be to your honor and to your glory alone. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Many years ago, I saw this great video. And if I were a good pastor, I would have had this video to play for you today. But uh, time is short this week. It's been a busy week. Uh, but you can picture this in your mind. There, it was a video with some children. And, and what they did is they told these children that they put a big marshmallow in front of them, and these little kids. And then they left the room. And, uh, and they said, if you will avoid eating this marshmallow, we'll give you two marshmallows. Uh, and then they had a hidden camera in the room. Uh, you know, videoing these, these kids. And it's, the, it's one of the cutest, uh, uh, commercial, cutest videos I've ever seen. And basically, these kids are sitting down, and they are staring at this marshmallow. And their eyes are as big as that marshmallow. And they're just looking at it. And there's no one around to hold them accountable. It's just the marshmallow and them, and that's it. And they're focused on that marshmallow. And you've got some kids that are picking up the marshmallow and looking at it and studying it and, and analyzing it and sniffing it. And you've got some kids that are licking it and you know because it's like they didn't say anything about that and then some kids that are just nibbling around the edges just to get a little taste and of course some completely succumb to the temptation uh, and so we understand temptation and we understand giving in to temptation from a very young age uh, from from children on uh, we understand what temptation is all about because it's hardwired into our DNA uh, but oftentimes we're not told how to resist temptation. Well, in order to understand how to resist temptation, we must understand what sin is and what temptation is. We've got to understand those two things. Now, sin is the choice that we make to act on the temptation. The temptation itself is not, in and of itself, sin. The temptation is simply being drawn toward the sin. The temptation is, here's the marshmallow, why don't you eat it? Doesn't the marshmallow look good? Kind of thing. But sin is actually eating the marshmallow. Now, I just want to make a quick clarification. I'm not suggesting that it's wrong to eat marshmallows. In fact, I have that on my mind right now. I want to eat a marshmallow, so I'm killing in this illustration. But, but eating a marshmallow is not necessarily a sin. But it's, it's basically the difference between sin and temptation is the, the temptation is leading you toward the sin, making you want to partake of that sinful activity, and the sin is actually doing what you should not do, uh, making a choice or making a choice not to do the thing that you should do. Uh, now, when it comes to sin, many people don't understand what's the big deal. I mean, you know, it's a lot of sins they just see as just private sin, doesn't hurt anybody. What's the big deal? Why can't I sin? Well, Paul talks about sowing and reaping, and he puts everything in, in the context of that, that farmer illustration, sowing seed and reaping a harvest. Now, I'm not a farmer. I've never been a farmer. I have no desire to be a farmer. The closest thing I, was, I ever was to a farmer was my, my father, for whatever reason, had a lapse in judgment and, and at some point in his you know, life and bought a chicken coop. And so we had chickens on our property. And so we went out and we got the, the eggs and, and we, so we were able, had lots of scrambled eggs and, uh, and all that stuff. And uh, so that, that was my, the closest thing, and I did not enjoy that one iota, and I have no desire to get chickens now, you know, for my family. But, uh, but that's the closest. But being a farm, you per, anyone, who, anyone here farmed before? Anyone been a farmer? Okay, so you all understand uh, this very well. 
Uh, the rest of you, you can use your imagination. It's pretty, pretty simple. But when you plant seeds and then you water those seeds, anyone had a garden? Okay, kept a garden? Okay, I've done it. Same idea. You plant seeds, you water seeds, and a fruit comes up from that. Well, Paul would say that everything you do in life, everything you do, you're planting or watering seeds. Everything. Every choice you make, you're planting or you're watering seeds. And you will get a harvest from those seeds. Now, here's the interesting thing. Most of the time, you don't experience the consequences of your actions until later. Just as there's, all, there's usually a delay involved. Uh, you'll plant seeds, and you may not experience even the good fruit from that until down the road, until later. Uh, you, you may not experience the bad until down the road. And so as we sin, there is often this illusion that sets in. Well, there are no consequences. I can get away with this. It's not a big deal. And at first, you can oftentimes get away with it but it, it'll come home, chickens come home to roost, so to speak. It comes down the road, it comes down the pike, there'll be those consequences there. Those consequences can be good and they can be bad. I'll give you, and for my life story, two examples of this. Uh, first, the good. I was, um, uh, at the time, um, in college, when I was a college student, uh, and I was involved in politics. I've told you this before, in a past life, very involved in politics. And, I volunteered on the campaign for one of the local supervisors. At the time, we lived in Fairfax County, Virginia, and I, and I volunteered to work with one of the supervisors in, on, in his campaign. And later on, I, I knew a friend that was in the office. Of the, he was the chief of staff of, the, of that supervisor's office. In Fairfax County, Virginia, they actually have paid staff, just like uh, legislative aides and all that, and he was the chief of staff. He called me in one day and said, we, Brian, we could use your help. And he said, there's this uh, piece of legislation coming up and Ernie, that was his name, could use your help uh, in researching uh, this legislation. So can you read through this and come up with some questions uh, and that he can ask at the hearing that's on this piece of legislation? And so I, uh, I said, sure, why not? And so I spent an afternoon researching this piece of legislation, wrote down some questions, um, submitted them, and, and sure enough, he used the questions at a hearing. Later on, my wife and I were volunteering at, at a parade in Herndon, Virginia, and he was walking down the parade route, one of the politicians in the parade, and so he saw me, and he walks up to me with a smile on his face and says, I can't thank you enough for that. That was such a huge help. Thank you very much. And I found out later that the staff was very impressed that he was asking these intelligent questions and stuff, you know, and so, so my, my ego got big for a little bit. I was like, oh, this is great. Well, sure enough, about six months later or so, uh, he calls me and says, hey, would you be interested in coming on my staff and working for me? So if I hadn't have done that, if I hadn't have planted those seeds and watered those seeds, then that would not have, I wouldn't have gotten a job out of that. So I ended up getting a job as a legislative aide or a Fairfax County supervisor, which is a pretty cool opportunity for a young man at the time. Um, now that's the good example of sowing seeds and reaping a good harvest. And here's the bad example. Um, I, uh, confession's good for the soul, bad for the reputation. So. Um, <laughs> I, I've told you before that I was not the best of students, and uh, when I went to uh, college, I saw it as fun time, you know, and so I went, to, I went to George Mason University my first semester, and I figured out real quick, no one requires you to go to class, you know, I mean, you know, there's, you know, you, you don't have to go, and so I got in the habit of skipping class, and just started skipping classes and whatever, and that led to skipping tests, too, <laughs> and skipping quizzes and everything. And, I be, and then I found myself so far behind, I was like, well, there's no, there's no point. But guess what? I'm a legal adult. My parents don't have to sign my report card, you know, and stuff. Uh, but they, they do have to pay my tuition, you know, at the time. And uh, so uh, I figured I could keep it hidden for a little while, but not very long. And sure enough, I debuted my very first semester. I went on academic probation, you know, because, because my grades were so bad. I was such an irresponsible student. Now, just so you know, Later on, I got, I took, it took me eight years to get my four-year degree, you know, during that time, right? Um, but during that time, I ended up getting married. I got married while in college. Jane whipped me into shape, okay? So I, uh, toward the end, I was on the dean's list. So I, I, I finished out well, okay? But here's, the, here's, here's the, the bad thing. I started out a terrible student, irresponsible. I sowed bad seed academically. Now later, I sowed good seed, all right? But here's the deal. I still had to reap the harvest from the bad seed over here. I still had to pay the price for this. Now, God, God is in control and he worked everything out, but for a little time, I wanted me to go to law school. This was way before God called me to be a pastor. Uh, but 
I wanted to go to law school briefly. I applied to law schools. Law schools have high GPA requirements, you know, for, uh, for undergrad. And even though, even I went to talk to the admissions people and they said, yes, you have a great GPA for, the, for your last two years in college, great job, wonderful job, but unfortunately, there's this over here. And so it, uh, it upset my average for the GPA, it lowered it, and so it hurt my chances to get in. Bottom line is, there's always sowing and reaping going on in every area of your life. And so, it is in your best interest and my best interest to avoid sin. Because sin represents bad seed. And those bad seeds that we sow when we sin will come back to bite us every time. Also, we should not want to sin because to sin displeases our Savior. When I was growing up, as a kid, as a young kid, I just didn't want, to, didn't want to do bad because I'd get in trouble. You know, I'd get disciplined. You know, my parents might ground me or whatever. And I don't want to offend anyone here, but my parents didn't have, didn't have a problem with corporal punishment, you know. And so, uh, didn't have a problem with spanking, you know. Uh, and so, I, I was afraid of getting spanked. And they never abused me, just want to make that clear. But I was afraid of getting spanked or getting, getting grounded or just getting a stern talking to. But when I got older, it wasn't the fear of punishment that kept me in line. It was the fact that I didn't want to disappoint my parents. I loved them. I loved my mom and dad. And I did not want to disappoint them. I didn't want to break their heart. I didn't want to hurt them. And so because of that, I, d I just did my best to do what, do what was right by them. And that ought to be our motive in obeying the Lord. We should love God so much that we don't want to hurt him. We don't want to disappoint him. We don't want to let him down because of what he did for us. And that ought to be our motivation. When you sin, you hurt two people. You hurt God, and you hurt yourself. You hurt God because you disappoint him. And it, by the way, you say, I can't hurt God. God's all-powerful. You can hurt God. The Bible makes that very clear. That's why it says in Ephesians 4 that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit, wherein we are sealed until the day of redemption. You can grieve the Holy Spirit through your sin. So we should not want to grieve the Spirit, and we should not want to hurt ourselves. We also should not want to hurt other people. Jesus says that the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest commandment is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So we should not want to hurt other people, and quite often our sins hurt other people. So the motive should be very clear. We don't want to sin because we don't want to hurt God, we don't want to hurt ourselves, we don't want to hurt others. And yet, we continue to sin over and over again. And the reason why is because sin is a trap. And the deeper we fall into the sin trap, the more we enjoy being in sin, and the more we don't feel and understand the consequences of sin. We see this in our culture, because right now we live in a culture and a society that denies there's anything as sin. I have met people who profess to be Christians that don't even like to use the word sin. I remember talking to one lady not too many years ago, and this lady, uh, you know, uh, by all appearances, a godly woman, and yet she made it very clear to me that she never used the word sin in her house when she was raising kids. That she didn't like, to, didn't like to even hear the word sin because it's an offensive word. Well, uh, that reminds me of this quote from C.S. Lewis who wrote this in Mere Christianity. And C.S. Lewis, Lewis said this, When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows he is not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he is all right. This is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you are awake. Um, and you understand sleep when you are awake, not while you are sleeping. You can see mistakes in arithmetic when your mind is working properly. While you are making them, you cannot see them. You can understand the nature of drunkenness when you are sober, not when you are drunk. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. So, there's a, in the Bible it talks about searing one's conscience. And the way we sear our consciences is by committing sin over and over again and we become numb to the effects of our conscience on us. We can literally sear our conscience. The deeper we are into sin, the harder it is to figure out that we're in sin, 
and the harder it is to figure out that we need help. And people wonder, by the way, I remember talking to someone recently, and she was, I, I laid out the, the evidence for God's existence. And she literally said to me, it can't be that easy. And I said, why not? You know, the, the, the evidence for God's existence is so abundantly simple and easy. You know, I, I mentioned this in, in the service yesterday, but to say there is no creator of the universe is like saying there were no builders for this building. It's as simple as that. It is as simple as that. And yet she said, well, it can't be that easy because if it were, then everyone would believe in God. And I said, Paul answers that question directly in Romans 1, where he says that we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The fact of the matter is we become so deeply ingrained in sin that we don't want to see the light. Jesus said that sin loves darkness rather than light. We love our sinful condition, and we would rather stay in sin than be in the light. And that is why people refuse to believe in God. In fact, the number one appeal for atheism, and you get right down to it, the number one appeal for atheism is there's no accountability. No accountability. So James answers the question really clearly on exactly what it is sin. And I want to I want to hit this. Uh, he answers this. We're going to jump ahead a bit. But in James chapter 4, James chapter 4 and verse 17, James says this. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does, it, and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now this covers the two types of sin. And there are two types of sin. There's the sin of commission and the sin of omission. The sin of commission is pretty simple. You commit a sin. So you, you know that it is, it, is, it is the right thing for you to be faithful to your spouse. And if you were to commit adultery on your spouse, that is a sin. You know the right thing is faithfulness. You don't do it. Therefore, you're committing a sin. That's the sin of commission. But this definition also takes into account the sin of omission. If you come across someone who needs help, and yet it's within your capacity and within your ability to help this person, and you know you should help them, and you refuse to do so, that is a sin. That is a sin of omission. And that's the one that gets all of us. You know, sometimes we can go several days or several weeks Maybe a few godly people can even go a few months without commit doing a sin of commission, you know, this direct overt sin. But the sin of omission gets us all the time because there is a lot of things that we know that we should do and we don't do. And, and, and it's because of our fleshly nature, inherently we become very selfish. And so I want you to think through this and understand the sins of commission, the sins of omission, and understand that when it comes to, the, when you understand sin that comprehensively, Every single person here is a sinner. We all sin. Now, the good news is, the Bible says that because we've got the Holy Spirit in us, we don't have to sin. We do not have to sin. Now, people, in one way, think that that's, that's just not true. That's in, you know, there's no way. But one of the reasons why we dismiss that is because we like having excuses. But one of the inconvenient things about this passage we just read, now we're going to dive into it more in depth, is that James takes all of our excuses off the table here with this passage. It's very inconsiderate of James to do this. Uh, but that's what James does. Let's go back to our passage and break this down here. Let no one, that's pretty comprehensive, nobody, no human being, anyone, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Uh, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now, we, we look at this and we're like, well, who in the world would say that God tempts us? Well, a lot of people a lot of people blame God for their sin. A lot of people do. And I'll give you a few scenarios on this. One, you've got the ultra-Calvinist. And this is, people may not think of themselves as ultra-Calvinist. But you've got the ultra-predestinationist. You've got people who say, God's in control of everything. And therefore, whatever I do, God's in control of it. God ordained it. So therefore, why can God get mad at me? Because I did it. You know, and they, they feel like I'm just a pawn piece. God already knows what's going to happen. God's ordained everything. So if I sin, God's behind it. God did it. And we let ourselves off the hook. And James is very clear. Just because God's in control of everything does not mean God's responsible for your sin. And you might say, well, how can that be? Let me, let me explain. In, in, a, in a real, um, uh, we'll use the church as an example. Um, we are a congregationally governed church. And that means that certainly at the business meetings, uh, but the congregation overall, humanly speaking, is in charge of the church, okay? So I serve at your pleasure as the pastor of this church. At any time, you can remove me as pastor. 
You're, therefore, as the congregation, in control of the church. But that doesn't mean that you're responsible for everything I do. I could go do something crazy, like on Wednesday night I talked about stealing the drum set, you know, and so you'll, 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 be, you'll be grateful to know the drums are still there, and uh, so I haven't stolen them. Uh, but, but if I go and I steal the drums, for example, that doesn't mean that you're responsible for me stealing the drums, even though you're responsible for hiring me as pastor, and even though I'm continuing as your pastor under your oversight, so to speak, under accountability, um, because I stole the drums, that's not, you know, I'm saying I'm responsible for that. That's my sin. You know, your oversight. I'll use a more human example. I, um, uh, as long as I serve at your pleasure, as long as you have me as pastor, one of the things the pastor is definitely in charge of is the pulpit. I'm in charge of who preaches up here. Uh, whether it's me or, or whoever else, I'm in charge of that. Now, I may delegate that to someone else. We have a guest preacher coming, for example, in April. He's a friend of mine. He's the counseling pastor at what is now Expectation Church. It used to be Fair Oaks Church. It used to be Bethlehem Baptist Church, but it's the church that I was ordained in. And uh, Roy Dowdy's coming in April, and he's going to be talking about uh, counseling stuff. Very, very important message. I hope you'll, you'll mark your calendars for that. It's in April, April 10th to be exact. But I'm delegating to him, inviting him in. He's in the pulpit. Now, he's under, in that sense, in, this, in, in the context of this church, he's under my authority. But that doesn't mean I'm responsible for every word that comes out of his mouth. All right? Now, likewise, we are under the sovereign authority of God. Everything that takes place in this world takes place either by God's intentional will or by God's permission. Everything is under God's authority. Everything is under God's sovereignty. But within that context, God nevertheless delegates a degree of free will to each and every one of us. And we have free will to choose whether to love God or not love God. We have free will to choose whether to follow God and obey him or not follow him and obey him. And therefore, we are responsible for our actions, even though God is sovereign. You must understand that. So you cannot blame God for your sinning. You can't say, well, God made me, you know, and I'm a sinner, and therefore, you know. Uh, no, you can't blame God for your sin. There's only one person to blame for your sin, and that's you. The same is true for me. God is sovereign. He is in control. And as we'll get to in a little bit later in the message, that's a great comfort to us. And we can certainly run to him and seek refuge in him. But we make our choices. We do so under God's sovereignty but we are still responsible for our choices and our attitudes, and we're responsible for our sin. And then James very, very rudely and inconsiderately takes another excuse off the table in, in verse number 14. He says, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That takes the excuse, the devil made me do it off the table too. <laughs> and how many times have we heard that one? You know, the devil made me do it. The devil did it. The de you know, well, the devil is certainly real. Don't, don't ever uh, buy into the delusion that the devil isn't real. The devil is real, and his demons are real. And, they, and the enemy is very much at work in the world today. But the devil can't make you do anything. Don't make the devil more powerful than he is. The devil is not capable of controlling your actions. All the devil can do is dangle the carrot out in front of you, but it's your choice whether you take that carrot or not. The devil can entice you. The devil can tempt you. The devil can make, put thoughts into your mind, but the devil cannot control you. The devil is not responsible for your sin. You are. In fact, James is very clear. We sin when we are drawn away by our own desires our own desires and i want you to hear that key word desire because that is at the root of sin what is our desires that's at the root of it what do we desire to do a person who desires to sin is probably going to sin a person who desires to avoid sin has a much better chance of avoiding sin many times though we do not want to avoid sin I mean, let's just be honest. We're in church. Let's be honest. Let's be real. Sin can be fun. And people are like, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> Sin's not fun. Can, sin can be fun. If sin weren't fun, no one would do sin, you know, right? right? I, mean, I mean, think about it. Uh, and, and again, sin of commission, sin of omission, 
It's more fun and more relaxing not to do stuff that we know we, we should do. That's the sin of omission. It's just easier and more fun just not to do it. Not to take that stand. Not to exercise that courage. Not to stick your neck out. You know, it's just, it's just easier to go along, to get along. The sin of omission. And the sin of commission, you know, we wouldn't be enticed if there weren't any, any temptation there. I, you, know, you know how I feel, for example, about lima beans. Now let's assume for just a moment that lima, eating lima beans were a sin. All right? And uh, one could make that case, but I won't. So anyway, let's assume that it were. And, and if someone, and the devil came and the devil dangled lima beans in front of me, there would be zero temptation for me to take part in that. I, I would have no problem resisting that temptation at all. That would be easy. But... Dairy Queen Blizzard has a different story, all right? You know, so if someone dangles a Dairy Queen Blizzard in front of me, that's a problem. Yesterday at the reception at the fellowship, somebody made vanilla cream or banana cream pudding. It looked really good from a distance. I didn't get a chance to partake of it, but I wanted to. Uh, and it had the vanilla wafers on top and stuff, you know, and it was just, it looked delicious. It looked wonderful. And I wanted it, but I kept my distance from it. And by the time I asked and inquired about it, it was all gone. So, uh, so that's cruelty, you know. But anyway, I, I, uh, I that, you know, that was a desire. That was a temptation. I was enticed. I was drawn to that, okay? I was not drawn to lima beans. I didn't see any there, thankfully. But I was not drawn to that. So my, my point is that sin, by its nature, is, represents something that we want. Something that we want. And he goes right back to the Garden of Eden. Eve saw the fruit, saw that the fruit was desirable, she wanted it, and that is what led to the sin. Now, the consequences of it, though, you know, the devil will promise great reward if we'll reach out and take the sin, but the consequences are serious. Look in verse number 15, then when desire has conceived, that's an important phrase there, that the desire represents the temptation, and Prior to the conception, there is no sin. You know, it's just a desire. So I would like to tell you that I refrained from eating the pudding because I was strong, you know. But I simply didn't eat it because it was no longer available to me later. All right. But the point is that having, when, when you resist temptation, um, then that is not a sin. That's a, that's a praiseworthy thing. You've resisted the temptation. But if the temptation remains there, and you continue to feed on that temptation, and you continue to dwell on that, then when that desire conceives, it brings forth the sin. It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. James uses a childbirth and, and human development illustration, whereas Paul used the, the farming illustration, but they're both pertinent here. Sin at first brings us at least short-term enjoyment and sometimes short-term fulfillment, but it always brings forth death in the end. Uh, you know I love American history, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a history example here. There, one of our most distinguished founding fathers uh, had a situation just like this, and he learned firsthand the consequences of sin. And his name was Alexander Hamilton. If you were to pull out your wallet, if you have a $10 bill, pull out your purse, your wallet, you've got a $10 bill in there, then for at least a short time longer, Alexander Hamilton is on the $10 bill. They're about to boot him off, but, but Alexander Hamilton is right now on the $10 bill. He should remain there forever as far as I'm concerned, but anyway. Um, Hamilton is, was the first Secretary of the Treasury under George Washington. Washington was the president. Hamilton is responsible, really, for our economic system. When you think about it, we live in Hamilton's country today. Hamilton is one of the most influential and distinguished founders. But Hamilton committed a serious sin uh, early on. Hamilton um, uh, had an affair, and a woman approached him, and, and he entered into an affair. He was, he was married himself, and he entered into an adulterous relationship with this woman. And at first, you know, ha now understand that when you're in a position of responsibility like that, there can be a lot of stress. And so Hamilton, no doubt, was stressed out and busy, 
probably isolated from his wife, felt alone, and all kinds of things. was at the top of the power grid in Washington, D.C., so there's all that happening. And you know, as well as I do, when you look at, at, at the stories and look at people who fall into sin, and you can see a lot of similarities and commonalities there, and Hamilton had that. He was in a position of power, a position of stress. He was swept up in politics and all of that. And sure enough, there's this opportunity for this adulterous liaison, and he jumps at the chance. He makes a decision, and he sins. He tries to keep it covered up, and for a while it's covered up, and uh, he tries to minimize the consequences to keep his wife from learning about it, to keep President Washington from learning about it, to keep others from learning about it. But then the wife's husband finds out about it, and and the husband approaches him. And the husband begins to blackmail him and says that if you uh, don't pay money, I'm going to let the entire country know uh, what you have done. And that's going to take down the Washington administration. It's going to take down you. It's going to take all that. And so Hamilton begins to then pay money to this guy to keep him shut up. Now notice how, how the sin has now gone from Hamilton meeting what he perceives to be a short-term need. And Hamilton having that short-term enjoyment and short-term fulfillment. And now he's trapped by the sin. Now he's in this situation, and now he doesn't know how to get out of the situation. And in fact, this woman wants to continue the affair even as her husband is blackmailing him. And it's become something that now is a nightmare for Hamilton. And whereas Hamilton was already stressed because of the nature of his job, now Hamilton is mega stressed over this situation. And so everything in Hamilton's life has gotten worse, not better, as a result of him eating the fruit, as a result of him jumping into this sin. His life is now worse. And so the blackmail continues. And finally, as those of you that know history, um, which isn't very many Americans these days, but those of you that know history, uh, Hamilton, his biggest rival was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson and Hamilton were like bitter enemies in the Washington cabinet. Now later, Hamilton's biggest rival became Aaron Burr. Uh, But at the time, in Washington's administration, it was Jefferson. And Hamilton and Jefferson were at loggerheads, and Jefferson's allies got a hold of the story. And Jefferson's allies found out. Again, it says in the book of Numbers, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure it will find you out. Um, And Hamilton's, uh, Jefferson's allies got a hold of the story, and then they went and they began to uh, pressure Hamilton. And finally, Hamilton got to the point that he recognized this cannot go on anymore. And Hamilton did something rather extraordinary for a politician. Hamilton came clean in public with the whole thing. And he wrote an expose on himself, and he published it to the papers and put it out there around the American people because what Jefferson's allies were now alleging is that Hamilton was using public money to pay off this guy. And so Hamilton said, enough is enough, and so he confessed to the affair, he confessed to the adultery, he confessed to the blackmail, confessed to paying, but he said, I have not used any taxpayer money for this. This was all my money that I used to pay this guy, but it stops now, the affair's done, I'm very sorry, he confessed the entire thing. Now, the damage had been done to Hamilton's reputation. Hamilton had been seen as a rising star in politics. Uh, Any chance that Alexander Hamilton had of himself being elected president was shattered with this. Uh, His political career was pretty much over. Um, He had left the Washington cabinet, and he never again attained any any distinguished uh, position in government. So it, it destroyed his political career although he remained an influential figure in New York. And his marriage was saved because of his confession and all of that. He asked forgiveness for his wife. His wife forgave him. His wife, actually, when Hamilton died tragically in a duel, his his, uh, wife uh, remained unmarried for the rest of her days. And she lived until just before the American Civil War. So she uh, she went many years without ever remarrying. She totally forgave her, her beloved husband, Alexander Hamilton. But... Uh, it was a devastating sin, a devastating situation to him. And that is the, what Hamilton learned the hard way is something that the Bible tries to tell us over and over again. And many times we as Christians today, we still don't get it. And we're very thick-headed. And we think that we're going to be an exception to this. But I'm here to tell you that sin can be pleasurable and enjoyable, but sin will destroy you. You can't hold on. You can't hide it. You can't keep it under wraps and think that it's never going to come back up and rear its ugly head. It will. 
And sometimes the way that sin will rear its ugly head and destroy you is sin can change you. When you go through the actions of you continue to sin, you continue to fall into temptation, especially when that sin becomes an addiction, and then you try to cover it up, that sin literally can transform you and can change the person that you are. And you can become more angry and more bitter and more desperate and more paranoid and less at peace. Sin always has a way of overtaking you. It is a cancer, and it will kill you, and it will destroy your family, and it will destroy everything about you, your reputation and everything. And the enemy is out to destroy Christians. The enemy wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your reputation, your testimony. He wants to tear you down completely. Make no mistake about that. But the enemy is going to dangle out these temptations in front of you, and he's going to give you the illusion to think, it's no big deal. It's okay. Just a little bit won't hurt. It's all right. And before you know it, you're trapped. As I've said before, I know Jonathan Wood here will agree with me a thousand percent. One of the greatest stories ever is Lord of the Rings with J.R.R. Tolkien. And uh, uh, Lord of the Rings. And, uh, and, and J.R.R. Tolkien captures this essence of temptation and sin and the consequences of sin better than any literary figure ever, in my opinion, other than the writers of Scripture. And Tolkien talks about the ring and how the kings of the world at the time wanted this ring because it represented power, and they wanted it, and they coveted after it. But in the end, the ring captured them, and they became slaves to it. And that is the nature of sin. We become slaves to sin, even though we think we're the master and we're not. We're the slave. And so do not be deceived. Do not be deceived, James says, and that is what we must know today. Well, as powerful as sin is, we need someone even more powerful to rescue us from it and the consequences of sin. And the great news is that that rescue came 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. And because of what Jesus Christ did by taking upon himself the sins of the world, by confessing Christ, we no longer have the eternal consequences of sin thrust upon us. We still have the physical consequences of sin and the emotional consequences of sin. But I want us to, before we um, factor into that, I want us to understand the big deal it is that we've been relieved, those of us that have confessed Christ, we've been relieved of the eternal consequences of sin. Because Jesus liberated us from the eternal consequences of sin, we know that the death that we experience here in this life is not the end of our days. That we will move on, we will experience life eternal in the presence of God the Father. We will experience life eternal in heaven where there will be no tears and no suffering. And that is our, now our, our birthright. We are now entitled to that. That is our inheritance because of our new birth in Jesus Christ. So we can rejoice in that. There are still consequences here in this life for the sins that we commit. Consequences that, that we must endure. We will all die one day because of sin and the sin that we've committed. Uh, and and so we must understand that. But even today, there is an escape. The Bible promises that when you're confronted with a temptation, there's always a way out. You don't have to sin. Because you've got the Holy Spirit in your heart, you are not a slave to sin. You can escape the temptation. You can get out if you'll take it. The key comes down to our desire and our protection, those two things. Now, when it comes to desire, I just got to call upon you today, uh, this morning, you must make it your biggest and boldest and most passionate desire to love God and serve God and glorify God. If you desire God more than anything else, then the temptations will not be as strong in your life. So what is your desire for God? And when it comes to your protection, if you really want protection, then the Bible promises, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We can abide under God's protection. In Proverbs, it says that the Lord, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. You know, what's interesting is when the devil, as powerful as he is, is, con- is tempting us and trying to lead us into, into, into sin, the best course of action is not to pull out our spiritual 45 caliber, so to speak, and try to fight it out with the devil, because we will lose, because the devil is a lot more experienced than we are at this whole thing. Uh, but instead of trying to fight it out one-on-one with the devil, our best course of action is to run to the name of the Lord, to run to his strong tower and seek protection. 
And the way that we can do that is by surrendering everything we have and everything that we are to the Lord Jesus Christ. The more we're devoted to God and the more we're surrendered to God, the more protected we will be by God when it comes to temptation. I'd like to invite the praise team to come forward to share with you the story of a man named Judson Von de Venter. And I'm probably not pronouncing the name exactly correctly. But he was raised in a Christian home. And about age 17, he accepted Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. He had a talent for art and for music. He graduated with a degree in art and actually became an art teacher in school. Uh, He also traveled extensively, visiting all the art galleries around Europe and all around the the known world. Uh, He also studied and taught music. In fact, he mastered 13 different musical instruments, um, which is pretty good. Uh, He could sing and compose music. The man was extremely talented, very gifted. And as a result, he was enticed to go into the world of music and art and, and be well known as an artist and a musician. And he was dangled in front of him was the prospects of performing in New York and performing all over Europe. And with his art and with his music, uh, the man could have his ticket set. But he felt the Lord leading him in a different direction. He felt that the Lord may have other plans for him. And so he found himself in 1896 uh, conducting music at a church event during a revival. And it was during this time that he surrendered himself completely to full-time Christian service. And as he surrendered himself completely to full-time Christian service, a song came to his mind. And that song is what we're going to sing now. If you'll stand with us now as we sing Judson Vander's song, I Surrender All. (laughs) 